welcome you to our online worship this weekend. My name is Farlin Clark. I'm one of the ministers for the Preston Road Church family. Thankful that you've chosen to join us, and I do hope that you find a word of encouragement, hope, and inspiration as you worship this weekend. As we look ahead, we're about to enter the month of September. I want to make you aware that currently our plans, we are going to begin having our outdoor communion service weekly. You should be receiving an email if you're a member of the Preston Road family each week that provides you with the time and the details of that event. Along with a link, we will continue to ask that you register if you plan to attend. We haven't increased the capacity to 75 people at this point. So if it's something you've been thinking about and you have not done that yet, we encourage you. We would love to see you socially distanced with masks on, yet it's always a time of encouragement as we gather together, sing songs of praise, partake in communion together, and share from God's Word. This past week, I had the opportunity to have a conversation with our children's minister, Stacy Losher, and she made a reference to kind of this time that we're in, and she used the analogy of it feeling a little bit like a roller coaster ride. Now that resonated with me, maybe for a different reason than it might resonate with you. Because if I'm going to be totally transparent with you, I hate roller coasters. As a child, I was fearful, not just of the ride, I truly thought people who were on that ride might actually have a death wish. All I knew was that when you reach the top of the hill, I always check my seatbelt, check the bar, the harness, whatever might be holding me in, praying that it held as we race downhill. And I think she's right. The last six months have felt a little bit like a roller coaster ride. The ups, the downs, the hills, the valleys, the highs, the lows, the joys, the sorrows, the griefs, the celebrations, even though all of those are normally and typically a part of our lives, for some reason, during this pandemic, at least for me, they have been a little bit magnified. And I felt them a little bit more than I normally do. And maybe it's because it does feel like a roller coaster ride. I am the person who generally likes a pretty good rut. I like to know what to expect. I want to know what's going to happen each day. The consistency of a rut is my best friend sometimes. And it's felt anything but normal. It's felt anything but a rut over the last six months. This past week, as I was studying and reading and reflecting in the book of Psalms, a couple of verses jumped out to me from Psalm 86, where David said in verse 5, You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call on your name. And I've sat in quiet reflecting on that verse this past week, remembering that God is good, remembering that his love abounds always. And as I read that verse, and then just a few verses later, in verse 11, this has been my prayer this week. Teach me your way, Lord, that I, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. And that concept of an undivided heart, and I think about and I reflect over the last six months, oftentimes that downhill on the roller coaster would come in my life when I was allowing the fear and anxiety to permeate my thought versus the reminder each and every day that God's love is gracious, 
and that he offers us a peace that passes all understanding. I pray as you continue in your worship that you experience God's abounding love, that you experience and discover as you worship and as you go through this next week that God offers us a, offers us a peace knowing that he is still in control and he is watching over us. Have a blessed day. Wonderful, so wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross has spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart could fully know. How glorious, how beautiful you are, beautiful one I love, beautiful one I adore, beautiful one my soul must sing. Powerful, so powerful, your glory fills the sky. Your mighty works displayed for all to see. All to see. The beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to see. How marvelous, how wonderful you are. Beautiful one I love. Beautiful my heart with this love cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you you open my eyes to your wonders anew you capture my heart with this love cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you My name is Ed Ballard, and I am honored to serve as one of your elders here at Preston Road. One of the most impactful events to me in the Bible is a story we all know, but I would like to take a moment to revisit how, as to how it took place. It had been a long day. The hour was almost here for Jesus to leave this world. Jerusalem was packed with Passover guests, most of whom clamor for a glimpse of the teacher. The spring sun is warm, the streets are dry, and the disciples are a long way from home. A splash, a splash of cool water would be very refreshing. The disciples enter the home where they go to an upper room for the Last Supper. One by one, they take their places around the long table. On the wall hangs a towel. On the floor sits 
a pitcher, and a basin. Any one of the disciples could volunteer for this job, but no one does. After a few moments, Jesus stands and removes his outer garment. He wraps a servant's apron around his waist, takes up the basin, and kneels before one of the disciples, where he unlaces a sandal and gently lifts the foot, places it in the basin, and covers it with water and begins to bathe it. One grimy foot after another, Jesus works his way down the row. He comes to Simon Peter, who said, Lord, why are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. You don't realize what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. In Jesus' day, washing the feet was a task reserved not just for servants, but the lowest of servants. In this case, the one with the towel and basin is the king of the universe. Hands that shape the stars now wash away filth. Fingers that formed mountains now massage toes. And the one before him, all nations, will one day kneel, now kneels before his disciples to let them know how much he loves them. You can be sure Jesus knows the future of these feet he's washing. These feet will dash for cover at the flash of a Roman sword Only one pair of feet won't abandon in the garden. Judas will abandon Jesus that very night at the very same table where they are now. What a passionate moment when Jesus silently lifts the feet of the betrayer and washes them in the basin. Jesus knows that these men are about to do by morning. They will bury their heads in shame and look down at their feet in disgust. And when they do, he wants them to remember how his knees knelt before them and he washed their feet. He forgave their sin before they even committed it. He offered mercy before they even sought it. And he offers us the same thing today. Our God is a true promise keeper. What an example of love and compassion our Savior displayed before going to the cross. Shall we pray to our Father? Heavenly Father, how can we thank you for allowing us to see the humility that you show by washing your disciples' feet before your own death? Thank you for the sacrifices that were made on the cross so that we might have eternal life. Allow us to remember those sacrifices by the way you instructed us to break this bread and drink this cup. It is in your son's holy name we pray this prayer. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But now I'm found, was blind, but now 
I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me, His word. My hope secures, He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing Hello, everyone. I hope you've had a good week. Next week, I am looking forward to starting my fall series, which I'm calling Follow the Fruit, Cultivating Christian Character. It's a series about the fruit of the Spirit, which Paul lists in Galatians chapter 5. This week, I've invited Dan Bouchelle from Missions Resource Network to preach. I always appreciate Dan's messages as he brings insight from his perspectives and experiences in global missions and relational discipleship. Today's message is challenging. Dan will challenge us to remember that even though we long to be back together in the same room, even though we're looking forward to hopefully being back together in this room soon, he will challenge us and remind us that the goal of the Christian life is not to meet together in the same room. The goal of the Christian life is to become more like Jesus, to follow Jesus into the world, to follow Jesus to places like Levi's house. Dan will be speaking from a story out of Luke chapter 5. This is what it says, beginning in verse 27. After this... Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect, complained to Jesus' disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They said to him, Well, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. In those days, they will fast. He told them this parable. 
No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new. For they say, the old is better. It is great to be back with you here at Preston Road. I, I am really growing fond of this church uh, in the last few years. It was great to be with you. I think it was last summer uh, when I preached here. And we are so honored at MRN to be partnering with you uh, in the work in Asia with the Allens and looking forward to the future of what that may bring. So thank you for the honor of coming back uh, to be able to speak with you about what God is doing in the world out of his word. And I want to start with a story. A few years ago, I was in Abilene for the Abilene Christian Bible Lectures, which they had rebranded as Summit. And I went into the library where they used to have books, and they now cleared them out. They've got computers and a coffee shop. And so I went into the Starbucks there to get a cup of coffee to kind of perk me up after a day full of, of lectures. And I ran into a couple of friends of mine who are campus ministers. Uh, and doing what I typically do, I kind of blew up their conversation and just sat down with them and started checking in with them. And after a minute, they kind of went back to their conversation which strangely enough was them discussing whether or not they should quit their jobs in order to do their ministries. You see, as campus ministers, their campus ministries were very vibrant and they had a lot of great work going on on the campus and a lot of groups and Bible studies and even baptisms and cool stuff happening. But on Sunday morning, not very many of those students were showing up in church. And they were getting a lot of pressure from their elders about where the college students were putting a lot of money and resources into campus ministry. We're not seeing much. And the campus ministers were saying, the ministry's going great. Let us tell you what's happening on campus. But it wasn't registering. And there was so much animosity and tension between them and their elders. They were beginning to wonder, could we do our ministry better if we quit our jobs and took another source of income? And I found that to be really perplexing. How could it be that professional ministers who are empowered to go minister to college students are thriving in their ministry and in trouble in their church? What's the problem here? Well, it's not that the elders don't care about college students and their faith. They care about that deeply. That's why they're raising the issue. That's why they are being somewhat critical of what's happening. And it's not that the Campus ministers don't want their students to come back and be in big church on Sunday. The disconnect was somewhere else. And it really wasn't with the values of the people in the conflict. So where is the problem? Well, partly the problem is that the church has a public relations problem with young adults today. That's probably not news to you. You've probably seen the, the information about the nuns and the growing uh, animosity or ambivalence of young people toward church. Most optimistic studies say that kids raised in church today will leave by 50% once they get out of high school, that we're losing half of the people who grew up in church. I'm not talking about the kids marginally related to church. I'm not talking about unbelieving kids. I'm talking about the kids who grow up in church, half of them quit after high school. And unlike other generations, they're not coming back after they get married, and after they have kids. So we have a public relations problem. And even the kids who continue to go to church after high school very often end up going to very different kinds of churches than the ones that they grew up in themselves. But it's not just a PR problem. I think the young adults, even those that are staying in our churches, are really questioning the way we think about church and they're saying to us, the church has gotten too inwardly focused, too institutionally oriented. And they're asking us to reevaluate our measures of success. Instead of thinking in terms of institutional metrics, they're asking us to think in terms of impact. And they're wondering whether or not the church really is the best expression of God's purpose in the world. Now, we can discount that. We can refuse to listen to that. And we can say, they don't know what they're talking about. 
But I think maybe we should sit with that question a little more. And the question, I think, is this. Where does God do his best work in the world? And, and I'm just guessing, but I'm pretty sure that the elders of these two churches are thinking that God does his best work in the church, in church-sponsored events, typically in church property, and the goal is to get lost people into the church where we can clean them up, where we can mentor them, where we can help them be successful in their Christian life. And so a successful church is a large, growing institutional presence in the world. But for the campus ministers, their focus is really on what is happening outside the church as people leave church events. And, and their focus is on getting people to fall in love with Jesus and live out the life of Jesus in their day-to-day -day world. And so for them, success is about transformed people out there transforming the world and their view of where church fits in that equation is somewhat different. And that's the source of the conflict. I think the question we really need to be wrestling with, and I think COVID-19 and this whole pandemic is forcing us to ask this question in a new way is, where do we find God in the world? And what is the church's role in that? It's almost like a, a giant Where's Waldo book where we're looking at the complex systems of the world and all the busy activity and we're saying, where do we find God in this? If you're looking at all of that busyness like a Where's Waldo book, where, what do you look for in the world? How do you spot him? Are you looking for steeples and crosses? Are you looking for something that looks like church? Or are you looking for something else? Is God only found when the church is gathered? Or can you find God at work in the world when the church is scattered? And I think we tend to, just by habit out of our culture, to look for God at church events, in church buildings, in institutional expressions of church, which in themselves are not wrong, but they are so limited because God is always working in the world beyond the church for love, for mercy, for justice, and he's calling the church to go out into the world and engage the world with him. And I think this is behind the tension we see between Jesus and his opponents in the Gospels. It's a wineskins problem, as we see in our text from Luke. It's an argument about what kind of container will hold the new strong wine of the gospel. It's a matter of locating the proper place to find Jesus in the world and the work of God in the world. And, and as I have read the gospels through the years, one of the things that keeps coming back to me is that Jesus was criticized more for where he worked and with whom he worked than the kind of work he was trying to do. In our text, Jesus is in trouble with the church leaders of his day for working in the wrong place. It's not that the Pharisees have a problem with tax collectors repenting. They would be thrilled if Jesus could get all the tax collectors of Israel to quit their jobs, to repent, to come down to the temple, to go through all the purification rituals, and to re-enter proper godly society. They longed for all of Israel to repent. They preached for all of Israel to repent, and tax collectors were the worst of the worst because they had taken sides with the occupying army. They had turned on their own people. They were complicit with their oppressors. They were kicked out of the synagogues. They were disgraced and disowned by their families. The Messiah was expected to, to punish them severely and to drive them out of Israel. This, was, this wasn't just religious. This was deeply, deeply political. And the Pharisees were a reform movement, calling people back to the holiness of God, calling people to abandon all worldly attachments, all of the contaminations of the Greco-Roman world, and be authentically God's people who lived out the law of God. And they said that if they could get Israel, all of Israel, to obey God for just one day, to observe all the commandments for just one day, then God would send his Messiah. And so the tax collectors were keeping God from saving Israel. Israel, because they wouldn't repent. They wanted tax collectors to repent. The problem isn't that Levi is drawn into the way of Jesus and is beginning to reflect on his life and turning to repentance. The problem is he's not going to the temple to fit forgiveness, and Jesus is showing up in the wrong place. You see, Jesus doesn't take Levi to the temple. He doesn't take Levi to the rituals of the law. He follows Levi back to Levi's house, and he does the work of God in the wrong place 
with the wrong people. And Jesus' presence out here, claiming to do the work of God out here, indicates that he's accepting these people where they are. It implies that he's sort of enabling sin, delaying salvation. These people need to be judged. They need to be cleaned up. They need to be pulled out and put in a different place. Where's the call to change? Where's the call to get right and get to church? Jesus is acting like the religious system doesn't matter why he even is saying disrespectful things about the temple, you see. But the Pharisees, they just don't understand Jesus' mentality. They don't believe in a doctor who makes house calls. They don't believe it's safe to go out there in the world. The world needs to get cleaned up and come in here. And Dr. Jesus says, why wouldn't I make house calls? That's where the sick people are. And he went into unsterile environments. And he took the risk of going where the contagion was and doing the work of God there. And the Pharisee said, that's too risky. It's deadly. But Jesus doesn't expect them to get it. That old institutional coat cannot be patched and made whole. Their old wineskin cannot be stretched to contain the new wine of the gospel. And Jesus did not have the time or the inclination to speak to the intentionally deaf. Jesus will not only minister to a leper, he's going to touch him because he knows that his touch makes the leper whole instead of contaminating Jesus. He will not only call a tax collector, He'll go to a tax collector's house and he'll sit down and he'll eat with all of his friends and he will be the presence of God in a place that seems as far away from God as possible. Now, why would Jesus do that? And why would we even think of doing that? Why would we leave the safe, sacred space? Because the Bible makes so very clear God loves the world and God is working in the world and God is calling us to join him in his work in the world. See, that's the good news. And and following Jesus into the world can sound great, it can sound romantic, it can sound heroic, until you get to Levi's house and you're out of control and this is not your space and it's not your culture and you don't have anything to rely on here except the preparatory work that God's already been doing there and your ability to step into that. The gospel calls us to get out of our safe Christian antiseptic health clinics and into the hangouts of lost people. And you can't go into those spaces without risk. And frankly, you can't hang out in those spaces without being criticized by those who are too afraid to join you. Are you up for that? If you join what God is doing in the world, You can't stay safe on church property. You can't ask everything to come to you. You can't make everything a destination you control where the outsiders come onto your space and do things your way. You have to leave the comfort of your space to go into that world, which is exactly what Jesus did. And if you follow Jesus that way, you're going to be treated the way Jesus was treated. Jesus is like that kid who keeps wandering off in department stores talking to strangers and scaring his mama to death. And people who passionately follow Jesus often look that way to timid and frightened church people. When I was a preacher, so often I felt like I had a tension with my church. And and the way I imagined it this way was, they seemed to think my job was to stand at the church door and to reach out into the world and say, y'all follow me in here. And I thought my job was to stand at the church door and to look back into the church and say, y'all follow me out here. Because the directionality of the gospel is outward more than it's inward. And the best way I've heard this described that really resonates with me is that when we gather, and we need to gather, when we gather and we have our events, our meetings, our times, our worships, It's like when a football team has a halftime. They come off the field where they're playing the game and they go into the locker room and they rest and they get some refocusing on what they're doing and they have a motivational speech and they talk a little strategy and they kind of get their heads together and they refresh themselves a little bit. And that's important and it's needed and, and you gotta have those times. 
But in order to play the game, you got to go back on the field. And a church that's really proud of how well it does halftime may not have an understanding of where the game is played. I have a, I have a good friend, grew up in a church that I used to preach for, who works in corporate finance. He's a banker. He puts together $100 million packages when one corporation wants to buy out another corporation. He works in a, a very complex and demanding world. His wife is also has a very demanding job in financial services. And we were talking a few years back, and he was just expressing a frustration with the church where he attended. He's no longer in a church of Christ. He's in a, in a mega church somewhere. And he was at that time. And he just said, they keep wanting me to lead things. And they don't understand how demanding my job is. They want me to come down and lead this or lead that or create events. He's like, I work a 60, 70 hour week just to be a husband and a father and to be engaged with my family is a challenge. He said, you know what I really need? What I really need the church to do? Equip me to have a conversation with Jesus in my workplace. I need somebody to mentor me of how to be a man of Christian ethics and how to talk about why I am the, how, why I am the way I am and how I value this uh, to my coworkers, I need some help learning how do I start not only a spiritual conversation but a Bible study maybe among my coworkers. I need equipping to take ministry where I am, but I, I just don't have time to come down and run events and meetings and other events. But he really needs the church to help him live his mission. But where does that mission take place? Now the good news is. If we get out of our safe containers and we go out there in the world, God is already out there working. I love the uh, statement of Paul from Ephesians 2.10 where he said, We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. God's out there in the world, creating opportunities, working in people's hearts, setting up conversations and he's doing something in us, and he wants us to connect the work in here, the work he's doing out there, and to follow him into that space. There are people who are longing for the good news you already know, for the hope you have. They don't know how to have that conversation. And they're looking for the safe person to have that conversation with. And they don't necessarily need an invitation back to a church event, which might be fine, but that's probably not the first step that needs to be taken. You see, Lost people are not going to walk into our space very often. We're going to have to go into their space as Jesus came after us. The church badly needs to recover the missionary mindset. The movement of the gospel is outward and then upward. And how are people going to meet Jesus and learn to trust him unless somebody goes to where they are and sits at their table and eats their food and develops trust with them and tells them a better story that can draw them into a better life. Now, make no mistake about it. If you follow Jesus to Levi's house, you're going to feel out of control. You're going to be disoriented. You're probably going to get criticized. You may not even look like a very good church member, and you may have to get disengaged from some church activities in order to have time to live out your mission. But that's okay, because the same people who criticize you for that didn't get Jesus either and criticized him. And... If you orient that way as a church, it may cost you more than money. It may not make all your numbers go up, at least not immediately, at least not all in one place. And some of those people you reach may come back here with you and find the kind of equipping and life that you find here, and that's great. But they don't have to in order to be into the life of Jesus. And I've spent enough time being angry that somebody that I helped equip led somebody to Jesus who didn't come back to my church, and I didn't get to count that as a win. I'm just, I'm just done with that. The question is, are these people following Jesus? Are we forming new communities of believers? Are we helping people on their mission? Because ultimately, we have to measure success not by how many we get to come here, but how many become disciples of Jesus through the work that God is doing in us as a church, we need to recalibrate success and measure more than just attendance. We need to be measuring the number of people who've been prepared and equipped to live on mission. We need to be measuring the number of groups that have been launched or lives transformed. They don't all have to come back here because the kingdom of God has more than one way to score. You know, you're sitting right here in the shadow of SMU. You've got a strong connection there. You've got a campus ministry. If you look at SMU or any other college, how do they measure success? 
just by the number of people who show up in class on any given day? I don't think so. They know how many are enrolled, but they care a lot more about how many graduate. And they really care about the impact they have in the world from their graduates. They've got multiple ways of measuring the success of their organization. And the church is not a school. We have different kind of metrics, but we need to be thinking about how we measure success in more than just institutional presence. I was doing a lab for a church a couple years ago, and we were looking at their missions policy. And one of the tenets in their missions policy was that for a church in the mission field to be considered mature, it had to have planted other churches. And I said, you know, that's interesting. I think that's appropriate. But I'm looking at your church vision, and there's nothing in your church vision about planting other churches. Why does a mature church in another country have to be a church planting church, but you don't seem to think that's required of you to be mature? And there was just dead silence. Now, I'm not saying you have to set a goal this next year to plant another church, but I do think we need to be asking the question of impact and replication. See, the question is not really, how do we get lost people in our church, but how do we get Christ in lost people? I know everybody's anxious for the church to get back together, for us to get back in the building, for us to be able to have services again, and that's going to feel like success. But what if this is our opportunity to think about the fact that that isn't really what the win is? That church is here to equip you to take the gospel where you are in your interactions with others. Because the question really isn't even how do we make the Preston Road Church of Christ a success, but how does the Preston Road Church of Christ serve the reign of God, expand the reign of God, multiply faith in the world? It's about you being in service where you are. And the institutional expression of the church and the staff are here to equip you to be on mission where you already are, whether it's online, whether it's in your neighborhood, wherever it is that you are present interacting with people, you can be on mission even in this time. Because God's mission is not for a few professional staff on a church or for a few missionaries or church planters it should be the driving force of every disciple and the church collective should be equipping us as families and individuals to live that out in our world in a way that impacts the world and even if we can't gather in a church building we can still interact in our world and even when we can come back together, and even when we can't have the big services, this is not where God does his most important work. This is where you are equipped to go out into the world and to advance the mission of God. So when it's safe to enter the world again in new ways, and when those parties start happening again, and God gives you that opportunity to engage socially at whatever level, you go to Levi's house. You join that party. You don't be afraid to go into a place where you're out of control and it's not your space. You be the presence of Christ there because God is a great party planner and you're not going to show up anywhere that he isn't already there waiting you to join the work he's already doing. Thanks to Dan for bringing that message and thank you for joining us. I'll see you next time.